it's more important in the virtual world because you're working with a much narrower window. Your customer or your audience, whatever, has a narrower mental capacity. And so it's harder to get a message across. And this, this becomes even more important. In a complete physical environment, it's important to be clear, but online it gets even more important. And in this next 40 minutes, you are going to find some really straightforward and tactical information on how to do this. Are you ready? Then let's go. I run a company called Aratium. It's actually a Latin word meaning an oral argument. And um, we exist because most people don't communicate as effectively as they'd like. In, in a lot of settings, whether you're a leader, uh, whether you're trying to raise money for a nonprofit, whether particularly you're a salesperson, there's often a very big gap between you know, the, the solution you're selling and the quality of your story. And we help people close that gap, whether they're, they're TED speakers or salespeople for a IBM or Cisco or Schneider or Siemens, we, we have a process and model and tools to help people fundamentally transform the way they communicate. Say you help this big company for that, is there like a number one mistake you see that happens so often, the, the same that just comes back all the time? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's many layers to that question. I mean, I think when we think very broadly about communications i think we we make one huge mistake is we 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 focus on style over substance that you know if you take any i'm getting very high level here but if you look at any communication skills training it almost always focuses on style you know, eye contact body language and these things are stupid they're completely irrelevant they have absolutely no bearing on whether you're effective what what makes you effective is the architectural structure of your message. Um, and if you get that right, yes, you know, delivery, how you deliver it does matter. But in fact, the things that matter are very different than, than what we tend to think. It doesn't, eye contact, body language, none of that stuff matters at all. What matters really in delivery is, is, is precision in delivery of the argument. But that's still at best, I think, only 20 to 30% of success. 70% of success is in the architectural structure of the argument. Now, if you go down then to the level of what, what mistakes are people making there, um, if you look at the typical sort of slide deck, um, it, it's usually built in a way that's completely counter to the way audiences or customers want to receive information. The problem isn't slides. Although I'd be very cautious about using PowerPoint, I would never present using PowerPoint. And typically we make three big mistakes. The first one is TMI. We pack so much into our, our messaging. Um, we, we have good motives. You know, we, we've got a big topic and it's complex and we want to be thorough and we want to be complete. And maybe, you know, Laurie, this is the only time I get to present to you. So I'm going to try and hit you with everything. And and these are all good motives. But they lead to incredibly bad downstream effects because we create cognitive overload in our audiences. The second big mistake we make is most presentations are just uh, fundamentally confusing or, shall I say, unclear. You know, it kind of makes sense to us, but audience are often just completely lost in, in what we present. And that's for many different reasons, partly too much information, partly there's no uh, logical narrative flow. Almost all presenters get too technical. They make huge assumptions on what their audiences understand, but they don't realize that that audience lives in a different world to them. And then the third big problem, and these three combined are why most communication fails are that most uh, uh, presenters are just fundamentally sender oriented. We, we see the world through our own lens, we present uh, from our own perspective. So again, this is just a slide deck from a very well known technology company. Um, and, and almost every slide here is about them, their product, their solution, how it works. And, and the customer would look at this and go, I'm not the slightest interested in this, I don't know why I should care. So it's a longer answer to your first question. But these three mistakes combined 
uh, are very, very common. Most presenters make all of these simultaneously, and they serve to make most communications completely ineffective. I like your super clear statement. Like, I think there's a study out there who suggests that uh, body language is more important than language, right? But it's a very it's a research that's interpreted in a wrong way. And the actual statement is like, if your language is different than your nonverbal communication, people tend to believe the nonverbal communication a bit more. So that research is going out there and states this quite big statement, but what you're saying is actually the opposite, which is quite interesting, I think. Um, and something I can in, in a way also agree with, like if you're, um, if you're, content just doesn't make any sense you can practice your your perfect hand gestures <laughs> completely but your story or your 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 point doesn't come across and that's exactly what you're saying in such a um clear way yeah. of explaining it yeah 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 there, there are there are a lot man there's so much to say about this i mean the number one thing I would hope people take away is forget that nonsense. Eye contact, body language, hand position. It's garbage. It doesn't matter. You never leave a presentation and say, oh, I hated that, that woman. She didn't make eye contact with me or that guy had great body language. It's just nonsense. People engage mentally, cognitively with substance. And as long as you're articulating clearly, that's pretty much all that matters. The study you're referring to is known often as the Likert study about how big and important body language is. It's, it's nonsense that, that you know, 90% of communication is nonverbal. That's not what it said. What the study said was uh, a large proportion of likability, whether somebody likes you, comes from nonverbal aspects. But that's not really relevant at all. The one thing you said that is interesting is, I think, or, or, or is true, is there is a term called congruence. Congruence is the alignment of what you're saying and the demeanor in which you're saying it. If I was delivering a very sad funeral eulogy for a child who died, but I was really upbeat and having fun, that, that would be awful. That would be a lack of congruence um, there's a great line, actually, in Hamlet, where, where we get an insight into Shakespeare's opinion on communication. It, it's expressed through a speech that Hamlet gives, Prince of Denmark. And he says, fit your action to the word and your word to the action. It's incredible. So back in you know, 1670 or whatever, uh, uh, Shakespeare is saying, yeah, there does have to be a basic match between what you're saying and the demeanor. But again, it's 5% of success. This is very rare. You're not gonna joke around at a funeral. This is not an issue. It's true, but it isn't the real problem. The real problem is we structure messaging in an atrocious way. And trust me, if you get this wrong, you get perfect physical delivery. It won't make you any better. At least in my view, 80% of success drives from the architectural structure of your message. And the 20% that's delivery is primarily about precision and exactness in articulation. So the, the pre presentation you wanted to make is the one you make. But if you want to be a great communicator, focus on message design, not on message delivery. And that is what the entire industry has, has got wrong. And uh, I'm, I'm really passionate about that. I mean, it, this matters because this is how you get better. I do, I do feel your passion. So <laughs> that's a good thing. And I think that is also uh, the one thing that I'm very interesting about in your opinion, because on one hand, you, you say very clearly that the, the structure and like the, 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 the content that you're delivering should make sense, right? Should not have too much information, should don't, not confuse, and it should be um, audience or orientated. Yeah? Uh, and on the other hand, yeah. you know, sometimes you have the speakers who um, present factually completely perfect. Like it makes a lot of sense. And in a way, the result of whatever that person wants to achieve is not gained yet. And often that is become because people don't like trust it or don't feel it or don't engage with it. 
And you said that you focus on um, on brain science as well. How how would you do? You want to advise these people who are factually very correct and yet don't get to the results they want to achieve. Well, I, th I think uh, honestly, Laurie, I mean this very respectfully. I think you're misunderstanding what I'm saying about architectural construction of a message. It's so much more than just making sense. Yeah, but that's part of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying, I'll just make sure what you say makes sense. What you want to do is design a message in such a way that it doesn't just make sense, but it's thoroughly engaging and thoroughly compelling and causes people to lead to action. Now, the, you, you, you raise an interesting word I want to come back to later, which is the word trust. There are some aspects of delivery that do align with trust. But it's not, this is, I am not saying, you know, fix your content, make sure it makes sense. And now we have to go back to delivery to make sure that people are engaged and committed and they trust you and they take action. No, that's overweighting delivery. And I'm, I'm really sorry if this is un, unpalatable to you, if this isn't what you want me to say, I'm sorry, but this is what I'm gonna say. Delivery has so little to do with effectiveness. It's the architectural construct. So let's think about what the architectural construct has to be. Let me take an example. This, this 100 slide deck becomes, if you rework it using our model, becomes a message that looks like this. Now, um, this has a new set of hallmarks. And when you get a message right, there will typically be six or seven hallmarks. One, unbelievably crisp and clean and simple. We cannot violate a brain bandwidth. If your audience switches off halfway through because you've overwhelmed them, you lose. That's a design issue. The second thing, almost all communicators get this wrong. Communication needs at its core to be audience problem centric. We can't build a message that's fundamentally about us. Uh, if I'm selling something, look at the, this is actually the messaging for WebEx. I think that's the platform we're on today. This is the messaging for WebEx. We built this with Cisco. Look at the, the statement on the front cover. It doesn't say WebEx. It says, with so many tools to communicate, why do your teams still feel so disconnected? Do you see that that completely orients towards that the customer in this case is problem? So this is a combat to sender orientation. The third thing you have to do in communication is you have to make sure that your narrative, particularly how you solve this problem, is an ideas-driven narrative. People do very badly with fact and data. They don't remember it. I could show you charts. I could give you numbers. You wouldn't remember it. But you would uh, find an idea far stickier. The brain, in fact, stores ideas. Um, and uh, what you need to do is organize a narrative around a small number of ideas. Those ideas need to be powerfully supported. Bryce, do we have a uh, poppy here? Let me, let me give you an example. Imagine I have an idea and the idea is that the loss of life for Britain in World War I was really terrible. It was really tragic. Um, I could show that to you this way and um, that's, that's factual, right? That makes sense. Data, 888,246 people. The problem with that is it doesn't grab you in any way, you've probably already forgotten the number and it's not gonna to lead to action. Um, now, not that there's any particular action I'm looking for in this case. Now, what if I took the same idea and I chose to convey it in this way? This actually was a, a, an art exhibit built in London in 2014. And what the artist did is he got 888,246 poppies as a sort of a sea and river of blood coming out of um, uh, uh, Windsor Castle, no, Tower of London, sorry. And, and the point, what's interesting about it is, is this uh, exhibit was dramatically impactful to people. They were so moved. So um, uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is, 
you want to develop an ideas-driven narrative, and those ideas need to be really powerfully supported. This, by the way, is where the correct use of visuals, visualization, and storytelling fit. They fit as a way of landing a big idea. The fifth hallmark, this an argument needs to be properly sequenced. There has to be a logic to it. You almost inevitably start with the audience problem, how you solve that problem, and then how we move forward. But most presenters lack any sort of logic. Remember I said here, they lack flow or logical narrative, and that leads to a message that's confusing. And then finally, the entire thing should focus in on and lead to action. Now, the really interesting thing is those, those you get that right, you will succeed. And you see it's about more than making sense. It's about engagement, problem centricity. It's about emotional connection, powerfully supported. But see that these are still architectural features. They're really very still not to do with delivery. So I, I didn't want to sound rude earlier, but when, when I say architectural and somebody says, oh, it has to make sense, so much more than making sense. This will build a really, really powerful narrative. Now, final thing, if you're interested, and this I think you'll find fascinating. What's the actual key to communication? What are you trying to achieve? What you are actually trying to achieve is not just to be compelling, but this is a dramatic thought. In fact, uh, what you're trying to achieve is something nobody even thinks about. You actually are trying to be retellable. This is the key to communication, to retellability. Let me explain, give you a very simple example. You're selling something, say. This is you. Uh, say this is me. I'm selling something to you, Laurie. So this is you, and I'm having a sales meeting, and you're a buyer. Is that meeting important? Yes. Is that the most important meeting? No, never. Why? Because you never make that decision in that meeting, and you never make that decision alone. Sometime later, this is you, there's another meeting. It's a meeting that I don't get to be invited to, and it's a meeting where the decision-making body is meeting. This is true of all communication. The other meeting, the meeting you don't get to be invited to, and this decision-making body is going to decide whether to do what I want you to do. And in that moment, the effectiveness of communication is not about what happened here. It's about whether you can effectively retell the story. Now, this has monumentally important implications. One is that if you know your messaging is weak here, it's bound to fail here. Why? Because you want there to help navigate around bad slides and so forth. So, you know, I might be able to make a bad slide deck work by, you know, ignoring the bad slides and, and so forth. But you can't do that because you, it's not your content. The second thing this means is that we all misunderstand the goal of communication. We all think that the goal of communication is here, first meeting success. It's not. The goal of communication is second meeting success. And of course, if you get this, you automatically get that. And then I think the biggest implication, if there, again, if there's one or two enormous things I'd like this, your audience to take away, is it changes the very purpose of communication. Is the purpose of communication to persuade? Yes, always. Is that its only purpose? No. It is equally important that communication equips. It's not enough here for you to be persuaded or motivated. You have to be equipped. I have to make it possible for you to convince this group. Now, how do you do that? Well, that's the seventh hallmark. The seventh hallmark is a document that supports, carries this argument, and it's built for retellability. Now, the reason that matters, Laurie, is that's the death of slide decks, because slide decks don't function in that way. I couldn't pay you enough to represent a deck like this. And even if you wanted to, you wouldn't be able to. So again, I apologize for long answers, but you asked a big, big question. The architectural construct of a message is about these six things and then embedding it in a document that allows for retellability, what that creates is a document, a message that will be incredibly powerful, incredibly compelling, and that will drive people to action. And we can talk another day about the other aspects of delivery, 
but 80 at least percent of success is here. And if you get this right, as long as your articulation is generally clear, you will be incredibly successful. Love the answer. And I, and I think with your answer, you're also re uh, emphasizing the importance of it, right? Because the fact that you were saying something to me, it automatically uh, runs through the constructs that I have in my brain, the associations that I have with the words. And that is exactly what you're telling, right? You want to get your point across in a way that they can, or people can tell the same story later in the exact way you meant it. Uh, and that's, I, yeah. I think, a, a perfect way of, of, of answering that question by by showing with example <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if we had more time, um, we, we could unpack uh, uh, e even more of this. This idea of retellability, I think, is uh, it's a hallmark of what we teach. But this is, I think, the new way people need to think about communication. If you're a leader, your messaging has to be cascaded. That's retellability. If you're doing a TED talk, you don't just want the audience to, to like it and, and, and be engaged and persuaded. If you're Bill Gates talking about malaria, you want those people you've met to go and, and evangelize or proselytize or retell the story. You always want this. And we don't, we don't build meshing that's very effective in the first meeting. And it's completely ineffective here. So we have to think totally differently about its construction in order to create that retellability. If you're pitching a nonprofit and um, you want a donation, there's always someone else in that decision. Maybe it's a grant committee. Maybe you're just talking to a wealthy individual, but she'll go home and talk to her husband or he'll go home and talk to his wife. This is always an issue. And the way we build communication completely uh, ignores it. I, I really like the, the the point of view you have and the clarity you you get it across, like a very uh, specific standpoint and going full on on it. Um, and what I'm what I'm well, this, is, this is not the first time I've explained this. <laughs> <laughs> really, I had no clue about that. <laughs> oh, it's really cool to feel your passion and to see you within all your uh, your notes. <laughs> There's only little little bit space, so maybe for a small question, so we can still see you. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, we need to finish when there's no when there's no room. I can erase this if I need to. No, this is a very helpful teaching tool. Um, the reason is it, it allows me to make connections between my arguments. So if I talk about problem centricity here. I can say, look, this is important because it combats sender orientation here. So this isn't just cute. This isn't just fun. This is unbelievably important. Imagine I presented this on slides. Well, problem centricity is on slide four, but sender orientation was on slide one. I can't make any cross reference. So this is a really important teaching tool because the entire argument is before us the whole time. If you want to Try and remember, oh, what was that? What did he say about powerfully supported? Oh, yeah, that's in here. So, yeah, this is actually an important communication tool. Yeah, it's great. And it, it's it's very vivid and especially for different kind of learners, right? We have the people who focus more on the words you say. I personally am way more visual. So you're helping me and all the people that think a bit the same like me remembering the stuff that you're saying, which is super, super awesome. Um, and I'm also thinking about these logical listeners, the listeners that just sometimes need a bit of science to back, to, to back it up, to fully grasp uh, a topic. And I know you, um, like this is not just something you created, right? It's like based on actually science. For the logical listeners, do you want to maybe elaborate a bit on, on how you infuse that knowledge into the system you, that you just explained? Yeah, I mean, we, obviously, today we have to choose where we focus. The entire model that we've developed is based on brain science, how the brain consumes information. So, for example, if you read a book, it makes sense because chapter four was preceded by chapter three. If you read a book out of sequence, the same content, it makes no sense. So that leads you to a line of investigation that says, well, you have to have a logical sequenced argument. And that's there. 
We also know that people are overwhelmed with information today. Uh, the typical Westerner is targeted now. They, they aren't just hit by, they are targeted by between three and 5,000 messages a day. I want you to think about that. But we know they will only engage with, you and I engage with somewhere between 100 and 150 messages a day. Emails, you know, articles we read, links we click on, phone calls we answer. So do the math, 100, 150 out of 5,000 is three to 5%. So communicators have to penetrate the barrier of, of, uh, of people who want to switch them off. And that's why we drive towards problem centricity. So the entire model we've built is based on how the brain stores information. One of the most important pieces is the ideas piece, the third piece. If I, if you, if you ended this call and somebody said to you, well, Laurie, what was that guy talking about? You don't in your mind have a recording of um, uh, 35 minutes or 40 minutes. What your brain is already doing is reducing it to a small number of ideas. So you might say, oh, it's really interesting. He talked about retellability, the, the importance of your message working in the second and third meeting. Do you see what you're doing automatically without thinking is reducing information to a small number of ideas. Ideas are the traffic of the mind. So what you want then is an ideas driven narrative. So every piece of the model is based on how the brain stores information. So for example, number four, if I tried to prove something with data, like the, 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 the 888,246, you would forget. If I try and prove it with story or imagery, you would remember. So this is an entirely brain science driven model. Hey, do you wanna see something fun on that? Go for it, super. Have you got Mike? <clears throat> okay, we have a client who wanted to test this. You're gonna love this. By the way, your, your podcast audience will see a video of this, correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. It, it's video, okay. So uh, what we did is we got a whole load of people and we put them in brain scanners. We worked with a cognitive neuroscientist out of Stanford. So we got a whole load of people and we measured different um, uh, aspects of brain activity. And then we took a presentation and we had it made the, the traditional way. So a lot of PowerPoint slides, they were quite pretty slides. And by the way, it was very well presented. We used some of the company's top salespeople to make their traditional sales presentations, technology company. Then um, we had two groups presented to the traditional way and two groups presented to with the, the, the message having been rebuilt this way, uh, this model. And it's unbelievable what we found. So the first thing to see is this. This is eye tracking data that tells us where focus and attention went. Now, remember, with the traditional model, it's a slide based model, but it also didn't really have big governing ideas. And so what the scientist told us is the, the focus and attention went everywhere. The audience is desperately trying to understand what, what is this about? What's the big idea? What's important? So they were looking everywhere. Now, the darker the shade, the higher the focus. Look at that big red dot in the upper left. Guess what's behind that, Laurie? Nothing. So the audience nothing's there so even though it's being very well presented the audience has completely lost track of the argument and so they just disconnect it now let me show you the same technology when the presentation was made using our model it's completely different um so this was a two-page document it's a bifold so imagine just an open document in front of you you see a perfect tracking with the argument. And in fact, if you can see the time series data, they're sort of painting the page with their eyes. It was perfect, which means they're learning, they're understanding. And by the way, by learning, that means they're gonna be able to retell. The second thing is look at the, the incredible red dot here, the focus and attention. That's when the conversation most deeply got into the audience problem. 
And so it drives engagement in an unengaged world. So that's really robust scientific evidence that the way an audience responds to a message um, is, is closely tied to its architectural construction. We've now proved that. Now, the final thing, and this is really, really funny, at the end of the, the, the two or the, the, the presentations, the audiences were administered a ridiculously simple multiple choice quiz. I mean, crazy simple to test basic comprehension. And look at what we found. Um, uh, two things. One, the audience that was presented uh, in the traditional way made 10 times as many factual mistakes. I mean, that's unbelievable. I mean, they, honestly, Laurie, it was like a child's quiz. I mean, you shouldn't have made these mistakes. But it's because they hadn't listened. They disconnected, whereas the group presented using our model, only one mistake out of all of them. Now, the other one's really interesting. The other piece of data is really interesting. We asked the group afterwards, would you be willing to come back and represent what, uh, what you just had presented to you. Now, let me tell you something interesting. This group, the, the, um, the audience was made up of a company's leadership academy, and they were actually offered credit. They would get credit towards graduation in this academy if they did this. So they had the motivation to do it. There was no punishment for them. There was nothing that could go bad for them, only a benefit of doing it but only 10% of the group presented to in a traditional way felt any level of comfort in representing or retelling the story. That's an astonishing number. Imagine I said to you, Laurie, there's a prize for doing this. It doesn't matter how well you do it, Laurie, that you get a prize for doing this. And you come back to me and said, no, I'm not doing it. But the group presented to using our model, 80% of them, were willing to come back and represent. Why? Because they felt that they had learned it. So again, today has been a really good example of short questions and long answers. I apologize. That's the scientific underpinning of, of all this. Um, you probably know this. I wrote two books about this. The book on message design is called The, the Compelling Communicator, and that gets into all this. The book on message delivery which is mostly about precision, it is the second book. But if people are interested, I'd, I'd start with the first one. And then I do have a, a TED talk. It's about to publish uh, shortly that gets into the details of one of the most important uh, architectural tools. But that'll be coming out in a couple of weeks, I believe. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. And you're like asking questions that I didn't even ask yet. Like, where can people find you? It's, it's amazing how well we... <laughs> are resonating with each other here <laughs> and you're just pulling <laughs> up information out <laughs> organically. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, it's good. Well, like I said, this is not the first time I've talked about this as you can, you can understand, but there's real value here. If, if you want to communicate well, firstly, stop worrying about delivery. Certainly stop worrying about physicality. The only thing you should think about is precision and you get there through rehearsal. So just park that. Then what you think about is, am I building a message that conforms to these six hallmarks? Just, just screenshot what you've got right now. Can it be simple? Can it be grounded in the audience problem? Can your solution or your argument be an ideas-driven narrative? Can you support those powerfully? Can you make it logical? And can you make sure it drives to a clear action? Yes. Now, you want to learn the various tools you can take our e-learning, which is incredibly cool, or you can read the book, or all of that stuff, that's fine. Um, and then remember, embed it in a document because uh, unaided recall in a human being will never exceed 10%. So if you want someone to retell your story, you can't go with unaided recall, you have to go with aided to give them something, but you can't give them this, this sort of crappy deck, because they'll throw it in the trash. So build a document that embeds this and you will be incredibly successful. And we've proven this with thousands of clients and from TED speakers to, to for-profit companies, executive communication, uh, sales messaging. This model applies in all of those settings. Wow.
you just literally open the box of knowledge and spread so much out there in such a short time. Well, I hope so. I hope that's not overwhelming, but but um, it's fun. And people want to connect. You can connect with me. Uh, do you have my, uh, just uh, Tim Pollard and just connect with me on LinkedIn. So Tim Pollard. And you can find me on, on LinkedIn pretty easily. Awesome. It will be also in the description, so we'll make it easy for people. Just like with the... With <laughs> Thank the you. That's perfect. Make it easy. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Great. Laura, any other questions? Any any other final question you feel is just really burning or really important or a particular takeaway oh, for you? It's actually one question that I wanted to ask you, which is a very interesting one, because maybe you've already asked it for yourself, but I just want to put it out there because I know uh, this is not the first time you're doing this. And I know you get asked a lot of questions. So a question that I want to ask you and that gives you all the freedom to, to fill in uh, as you want it to be is, is there one question that nobody has ever asked you, but that you're dying to answer? <laughs> um, what a great question. Um, maybe that is the question. Um, not really, but only because I do so much speaking and so many podcasts. Um, I've been asked kind of every every question imaginable. Um, I think I think the thing that I get most excited about, maybe I can twist it around, is this: is I, I think when we start thinking about retellability, we change everything because anyone could look at the traditional presentation and say. I don't know how it would work in the first meeting, but I know it can't work. It, it can't work here. And I think that that is the most interesting place. I've spent so much time over the last few years uh, thinking about this. Um, and, and by the way, when the world went from live to virtual, this all got much harder because the virtual world is socially narrow. Um, you, If you and I were in the same room, it would be much easier for me to understand how you're responding to what I'm saying. Um, you know, if you're puzzled, if you're confused, um, and then I would, if I'm a good communicator, and particularly if I'm um, have a high social IQ, I might see Laurie. Oh, you look pretty puzzled. So then I would respond to that. Laurie, you look puzzled. How, where have I lost you? You lose almost all of that in in the virtual world. So. What's been really interesting to me in the last couple of years is how everything I've described, how you then have to make that work in a virtual world. Now, the good news is this model works perfectly well in the virtual world because it's about the brain. And in fact, it works. It's more important in the virtual world because you're working with a much narrower window. Your customer or your audience, whatever, has a narrower mental capacity. And so it's harder to get a message across. And this, this becomes even more important. So the big question we were asked was, that, that, that we have been asked, but it was the big question is, how the heck does this work now in a virtual or hybrid world? And that's been really fun to think about. And we're producing, um, we actually have an e-learning on that, mastering communication in a post-COVID world. Um, that's all about how you engage with people particularly in a virtual environment. Wow, that's awesome. It was an open question, but you filled it absolutely amazing. Yeah. So thanks. <laughs> Great question. Great question. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and with that, I just want to thank you for your time because I'm sure these people that listening to this have had a, have a great amount of value that they can take notes with, but they can also put screenshots because the notes are also in uh, like visible for all of us, which is <laughs> awesome. so, yeah. so, so yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Told you this was going to be straightforward and highly technical. And I really hope that you took as many notes as I did because there were crazy, a lot of golden nuggets out there. So to anchor it in for yourself, please put your biggest aha moment in the comments. If you're willing to learn more, then subscribe to the channel because there's way more cool stuff to come and like the video so other people see it as well. See you in the next one.